The Norfolk and Norwich Hospital Nurses Registers, 1900 to 1928. In 1887, the British Nurses Association was created, giving nurses professional recognition and registration. In the early 1900s, more training hospitals were established, offering training in return for free nursing care. Until the Nurses Registration Act in 1919, any hospital could set up a training school and run its own training programme. The Norfolk and Norwich Hospital ran a three-year certificated course and introduced a four-year course in 1904. The first National Professional Register of Nurses was introduced in 1919, but training hospitals were already keeping their own records. This is a typical page from the Norfolk and Norwich registers. We will be looking at volumes one to three, each volume varying in style, but not in content. It records those who trained at the hospital from 1900 to 1928. Only these are currently open documents. There are a further seven volumes. Let's look in more detail. Here we can see the name, address and age of the trainee and the date they started. This allows us to explore genealogical records to find out more about these women. It records the names of the doctor examiners and some comments. It lists the different ward numbers with dates. An additional bonus are the photos of many of the women, usually only of those who went on to qualify. The second page breaks down how the time was spent in training, which wards the nurses worked on and any holiday time that they might have taken. The register was completed by matron, the vast majority by matron can, who completed the registers from the start of volume one until well into volume three. Her forthright and candid remarks give a fascinating insight into the lives and personalities of many of these women. Lily Beebe, deemed unsuitable, had come from Heatherset. The Beebe family are recorded in the Norfolk School Survey of 1903, where her father was headmaster of Heatherset British School. This is a good example of how these records can lead you in other directions and link up with other areas of research. Let's look at some numbers. 560 names in total from the three registers. Two arrived as trained nurses, but the rest were probationers. The youngest women were 20 until volume three, when we begin to see 19 year old probationers. In volumes one and two, 50%, 57% of the women were under the age of 25. In volume three, this increased to 75%. The oldest woman recorded was 43, but she had lied about her age and was soon dismissed. The hospital must have had an excellent reputation because women came from far and wide to train in Norwich, many from UK cities that would have had their own training hospitals. It also attracted many from Norfolk itself and East Anglia. In the first volume, 21% came from Norwich and 21 from the county. In the next two volumes, the figure for Norwich dropped down to 8%, but it rose to 36% from the county. A small number came from abroad, several came from Ireland. Some were more successful than others, although you are left wondering why. Take, for example, Olga Hansen from Copenhagen. She did not complete her training and left six months later. Can commented, she was a Dane and very tall, at least six foot and quite unsuitable for nursing male patients. Your imagination may fill in the details. So what attracted these women to Norwich? Probably a number of factors, an opportunity to move away from home, 
to be independent, to see a different part of the country, to better themselves, just like young people today wanting to leave home and spread their wings. The First World War impacted on recruitment. Some went off to do military nursing when war broke out. Others came to the hospital having had some experience during the war, usually as VADs with the Red Cross. The registers specifically mention 17 women doing military nursing, but there were some whose military nursing is not recorded in the registers. Sadly, there were those military nurses who lost their lives as a consequence of the war. And their names can be found on the Roll of Honour of Norfolk Women, on the Roll of Honour in Norwich Cathedral, and on the memorial screen in York Minster. Lillian Silver Duffin and Jessie Wakefield were two such nurses. Lillian and Jessie trained at the hospital from 1908 to 1911. Jessie served in France, where she contracted meningitis and died in 1919. She is buried in Etaple Military Cemetery. Lillian was demobbed in 1919, but carried on military nursing in India until 1922, when she was diagnosed with neurasthenia. Today we would call it post-traumatic stress. She was certified insane and died in 1926. We have no photo of Lillian. Two other nurses are named on the Roll of Honour of Norfolk Women, but their connection to the registers is by being related to two doctors whose names appear frequently as examiners on the register pages. Both men created nursing memorials in their relatives' honour. Standing far right is Dr Sidney Long, and third from right standing is Dr Burton Fanning. Dr Long's sister, Alice, had been a sister at the hospital in 1900. She returned from nursing in Zululand in 1915 and joined the Queen Alexandra Imperial Nursing Service. She was sent to Malta where she became ill and returned to England where she died in 1918. The Alice Long Memorial Medal was awarded to the most proficient nurse in training and in the final exams. The local Nurses League keep detailed records of these awards. The Burton Fanning family were well known and highly respected in the city. Daughter Berris had volunteered in Norwich, helping unload wounded soldiers coming in on the train to Norwich Station to the Norfolk War Hospital. She then, as a VAD, went to nurse in Cambridge. Berris died at the age of 22 in 1916, when her nightdress caught fire after a long shift. The Berris Burton Fanning Memorial Fund was created to support nurses in their training. Over the whole period, 61% completed their training. Overall, about a third stayed on to work at the hospital. Some went abroad and several went on to do midwifery training or district nursing. Josephine Pegg was awarded the Alice Long Memorial Medal and also had her midwifery fees paid for by the Berry Spurton Fanning Memorial Fund. Helen May Britton qualified in 1908, and she worked at the hospital until 1925, leaving to take up her sister's corner tea house in Norwich. From Can's comments, we see that tipping nurses was an accepted practice. Can noted that Britton and her assistants had given up their tips to the hospital for many years, amounting to 20 to 30 pounds a year not an inconsiderable sum. Many progressed in their careers and some became sisters at the Norfolk and Norwich Hospital. There is reference to the sisters' registers 
but their whereabouts are unknown. Thirty nine per cent of the women did not complete their training. While one cannot fault their initial commitment to undertake training, the reality must have come as quite a shock for some. Therefore, a three month trial period was a good idea for both parties, and many took this opportunity to leave, some after only a matter of days. Several had genuine reasons for leaving, such as health problems, family circumstances, and homesickness. Others left to get married. During the war years, there was an urgency to bring forward this event. There were many reasons why some were deemed unsuitable and had to leave. But one has to question the selection process when several women left because of characteristics that should have been evident at the outset, such as being too short. It took three years to decide that Lavinia Condon was too old to take kindly to training. Lavinia left in 1918 and sadly died in Norwich three years later, aged only 41. Norwich was not such a fine city for others, proving to be either too close or too far from home. Two trainees left because their doctors thought Norwich was too bleak for them, while some of those coming from Norwich were too close to friends and family to focus on their training. Inappropriate behaviour led to others not completing their training. It was more difficult for those wanting to leave after the trial period and some would resort to lying to get out of their contract. Two were sent away for stealing, while others failed to understand professional boundaries. Joan Steadman ran away. She was found with the husband of a patient on her ward. Can wrote, this man told a detective that Miss Steadman came to his house and at first said she was off duty and then that she had left the hospital because she was miserable. He took her to his mother's house and then to the pictures to cheer her up. And what on earth was Edith Byatt doing that caused Can to write, unsuitable, on Christmas Day she lost her head. Three women died during their training. Their names are all in volume two. Mabel's and Maud's deaths prompted the nurses to request an investigation. This photo shows the response from the hospital committee. Can wrote that Maud was one of the most promising probationers we have had and that Sabina was a conscientious and promising nurse, a general favourite. One other nurse worth a mention is Lillian Wade. Can did not think too highly of Lillian when she was training at the hospital, but Lillian went to India. She married and became Mrs. Starr. Her husband was a doctor at the hospital where she worked. Lillian was involved in the rescue of a kidnapped major's daughter in India, and she was awarded a medal for her bravery. The two matrons during this time were Florence Anne Can and Edith Olive Jackson. Can was matron from the start of the registers until well into the third volume when she retired in May 1926. Jackson was matron from then until 1939. The vast majority of comments and information we have come from Can's time as matron. We have no photo of Can, but this group photo, severely cropped, must surely show Jackson with her nursing team. Can, born in 1865, came from Devon. She trained at Westminster Hospital, then worked in hospitals in Wolverhampton and London. We do not know exactly when she came to Norwich. 
1917, she was awarded the Royal Red Cross for her work with wounded soldiers. It was presented to her by the King. She retired to Paynton to live with her sister Agnes, also a retired matron. Jackson was born in 1893. When she became a war widow, she went to train at King's College Hospital in London. Before coming to Norwich, she had been matron at St Peter's in Covent Garden. Jackson was involved in many modernising changes at the hospital in the interwar years. She established the hospital annual summer fete and made sure that the nurses had opportunities for lots of extracurricular activities. In 1939, she returned to London. The Norfolk Record Office has a wealth of records linked to various hospitals across the county. What I hope this talk has shown is how one document, or three in this case, can be either a fascinating story in itself or can lead you to many other areas of historical research. I think this is evident when we look at some of the resources this piece of research has tapped into. Thank you for listening.